The word revolutionary applies with full force tonight as we survey the life and work of one of computing history's towering figures, Sir Morris Wilkes. This program is a worthwhile trip in the Wayback Machine on two levels. First of all, it takes us back to the earliest roots of the museum, for it was 32 years ago in September 1979 when Professor Morris Wilkes, uh, not yet a sir, gave the opening lecture at the Computer Museum in Boston. And the cover of your program tonight is the very cover of that opening program from the Computer Museum 32 years ago. On another level, it allows us to introduce all of you to a very good friend of the museum, Dr. David Hartley. David is retired in the same way our chairman, Lynn Schustick, is retired, which is to say more active in his life than ever before. David had a long and very distinguished career in computing at the University of Cambridge. He read mathematics and computing at university there. He obtained his PhD there and for more than two decades ran the Cambridge University Computing Service. His experience ranges from advanced high-level programming languages to Britain's broadband network rollout. He has advised the highest levels of the British government, including Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. He's a fellow of the British Computer Society and chairman of the Computer Conservation Society in the UK, which we heard at lunch today, is doing so much to restore and build replicas of some of the world's great computers. But our chief interest tonight is in Dr. Hartley's long professional association with Sir Morris, who died in November at the age of 97. Morris Wilkes left an indelible stamp on modern computing from its earliest days. His pioneering work on the EDSAC system at Cambridge moved electronic stored program computing forward in a major leap. The first calculation ever performed by EDSAC, by the way, occurred 62 years ago last week on May 6th. The innovations in computing at Cambridge under Sir Morris came thick and fast, and we will hear about many of them tonight. He also had a fascinating post-retirement career, post-retirement in the same way David has a post-retirement career, at DEC, and he taught at MIT. But there's more to the story of Sir Morris than simply his achievement as one of computing's foremost pioneers. He understood not merely the science behind computing, but the social implications, as we shall see. The list of honors accorded to him is as long as your arm. They include his knighthood in 2000. And right up there uh, with being knighted in his mind, I'm sure, was being named a fellow of this museum the following year. Finally, he was not only a builder of great systems, he was a builder of great minds. And David Hartley is one example of that. Tonight with David, we will look back on the remarkable life and accomplishments of this remarkable man with someone who knew him well who was a colleague and a friend, who worked by his side for a generation, who visited with him every two weeks or so, right up until his final days, and who is helping to lead a series of tributes in the UK to Sir Morris this summer. And I know personally from David that we're being treated to a wonderful and very special sneak preview of the tributes that will be delivered to him later this year. So please join me in welcoming for a conversation to our stage Dr. David Hartley. As I mentioned, in September 1979, Morris Wilkes, then professor of computer technology at Cambridge, gave the opening lecture at the Computer Museum. He was 66 years old at the time and was within a year of retirement from his chair. Uh, David has uh, helped us remember we have a film of Morris Wilkes delivering that lecture. And we're going to begin by showing about three minutes of Gordon Bell's introduction in which he lists uh, Morris's many achievements, milestones, and honors. Professor Morris Wilkes, from the, who's head of the computer laboratory at the University of Cambridge. Um, he was born in England in 1913. He studied pure and applied mathematics at Cambridge University and did his doctoral thesis work at the Cavendish Lab in radio physics. During the war, he was engaged in radar and operations research, and when the war was over, returned to Cambridge to take charge of the mathematical laboratory, now the computer laboratory. He was responsible for the construction of EDSAC-1, which was working in early May 1949. Uh, Professor Wilkes was the first president of the British Computer Society, of which he is now a distinguished fellow, and was one of the 
group of consultants assembled by UNESCO to organize the first international conference on information processing in Paris in 1959. Uh, he helped to found the International Federation of Information Processing and was the British representative on the council of that organization until 63. During the period 59-60, uh, he was a European member of the ACM Council. He became a fellow of the Royal Society in 1956. In 1967, he received the ACM Turing Lecture and in 68 received the Harry Good Memorial Award of the American Federation of Information Processing Societies. In 1969, he was elected an honorary member of the Information Processing Society of Japan. Uh, uh, and in 1974, an honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 1977, he became a foreign associate of the National Academy of Engineering uh, here in the U.S. He holds numerous uh, honorary degrees. He was general chairman recently of, of the third software engineering conference in May 78. Uh, with two colleagues, Professor Wilkes published the first book on computer programming, appearing in, in 51. Later he wrote a book on automatic digital computers and in 66 a book uh, entitled A Short Introduction to Numerical Analysis. At the end of 68, uh, he published the Timesharing Computer Systems uh, uh, book. Uh, he is the joint author of a forthcoming book, The Cambridge Cap, uh, computer and its operating system, uh, a capabilities-based uh, system that was built at, at Cambridge recently and soon to come out. He is the author of a monograph on oscillations on, of the Earth's atmosphere, atmosphere. He has published many original papers in the computer field, including uh, the formulation of the concepts of microprogramming and then, uh, to my recollection, the first uh, paper on look aside memories, which we now call, ca which have become known as cache memories. So today he's going to speak on the birth and growth of the digital computer personal reminiscences. So I give it to Professor Wilkes. This is just a list uh, because they went by so quickly of the, of the accomplishments and awards of Morse Wilkes over his career. I mean, just look at that. Uh, the Turing Award in, in 1967, the Harry Good Award, uh, being made a foreign associate of uh, the distinguished U.S. academies, the Faraday Medal, uh, the CNC Prize in Tokyo, being made an ACM Fellow, the von Neumann Medal, Knighthood in 2000, uh, a Fellow here in the IEEE 60th Anniversary Award, and his many honorary degrees. I mean, what an incredibly distinguished life and uh, career. And I would like, uh, David, for you to start right at the beginning. So why don't you tell us a little bit about his boyhood and his school. Yeah. As a boy, he was very encouraged by his father to have an interest in electronics. Um, and he built his own radio transmitter uh, and was allowed to operate it at home. I think it was quite a privilege. Um, but then in 1931, he went to Cambridge as a student in mathematics. He entered St. John's College. Um, and I have a quote from him. I've got many quotes to say tonight. He said, I rather deliberately avoided getting too deeply involved with amateur radio in Cambridge, since I felt there were so many other things to do. A typical Maury statement. But he held the license for the amateur radio student station in Cambridge while he was a student. And of course there, he meets uh, and becomes acquainted with Alan Turing. Well, Alan Turing was there at the same time, and indeed he did meet him. But again, I got some quotations from him, from Wilkes. Uh, Turing was not at St. John's College, he was at King's College, and being at different colleges did make some difference. Morris said, Turing and I took the mathematical tripos in 1934, but I do not have a clear recollection of him from those years. That was a rather defensive statement. But in a recent interview published in the ACM Communications, you may have seen, he said, Alan Turing was an exact contemporary of mine and that means I, have to re I don't have to regard him as a great man, because you don't regard your contemporaries as great men. That's a wonderful cop-out from a question which said, you didn't like Turing, did you? Um, he said, we took the tripos together, and we both got the highest honors, so that was all right. Then separately, he said, I liked Turing. We got on very well together. 
He liked to lay down the law, and that didn't endear him to me. I can imagine that. People sometimes say I didn't get on with Turing, but it's just not true. But then I was very careful not to get involved. He was not in any sense a team leader. He didn't know how to get things done. So that deals with Alan Turing. So what aroused his interest in computing? Well, he went to a lecture by Douglas Hartree, uh, who was a very important professor of, of mathematics in those days, and very much involved with computing as then was, which was the hand calculation using uh, mechanical machines. And Hartree gave a lecture on the differential analyzer, which had been made out of Meccano, of course. And as Morris said, he found it irresistible. And I think that set the pattern for much of what Morris did after that. But in 1937, the university had a report written on the need to establish a computing laboratory. They called it the Mathematical Laboratory, and its job was to acquire a differential analyzer and other mechanical calculators and to provide a service to scientists doing computations. It was known as the Maths Lab, but as Morris said, it took 33 years for the university to put that right and call it the Computer Lab. And that was important to him, but I think they probably called it the Maths Lab to appease the mathematicians, so they felt it was part of them. Um, they appointed a part-time director, a theoretical chemist professor, to be in charge of the lab, and Morris was the only, the first employee. And it said, he was in charge day to day, he had a small salary, and he provided technical assistance to research, for research computations. His grade in the university was that of demonstrator, which is a quaint Cambridge term for associate professor. But before this could get established, 1939 came and World War II began, and he had a phone call from Sir John Cockroft. You may have heard the name John Cockroft. Uh, he was head of the atomic energy research work for civil atomic energy after the war. Uh, and he reports to Morris this phone call. Cockroft speaking. Can you be at the Air Ministry at 19.30 hours on Thursday morning? And then Morris says, I was not used to receiving such peremptory commands from Cockroft, but I pulled myself together and said I would be there. So Morris actually spent a very happy war, nothing to do with computing. He was installing radar sets around the British coastline. And he got involved also with a new subject called uh, operational research. But when people say, you know, about operational research, what is it? He said, well, it was drinking gin in the mess. <laughs> <laughs> so the war ends in 1945, and what happens next? Well, he came back to Cambridge, very smartish, um, and, but the director, the part-time director, was still doing his war service, so Morris found himself the most senior member of staff, so they made him acting director. And there was a lot of time, talk at that time, about developing the ideas of computers. The ENIAC at the Moore School, of course, in Philadelphia, was the focus of much attention, and I understand that Morris became, in, oh, sorry, that was your word, <laughs> and... Um, the Moore School lectures happened, as you know, in 1946, and they were spread over quite a long time, a two-month period, and Morris received an invitation to go. And I think this, again, was Douglas Hartree who arranged that. Um, but getting to the States in 1946 was not easy. First of all, he had to get a visa, and then he had to find a, a, a ship, a boat, or something to get here. Uh, and in the end, uh, he got a cargo vessel, and when he got on the cargo vessel, no one on the vessel knew where it was going and where it was going to land. Perhaps in New York City, they didn't know. And it broke down several times. Um, and it took two weeks for him to get here. So by the time he arrived, the lectures were well underway. Um, but nevertheless, he found them very enjoyable. Uh, and of course, the main thing that came out of the Moore School lectures in Morris's mind was the EDVAC report written by John von Neumann and this proposed the use of delay lines as a form of storage for instructions and data in a computer. Morris immediately decided that this was the way forward and that the days of analog machines, which were much debated in those days, were numbered. So he traveled back home, first on a train to Boston, and then on the Queen Mary back to Southampton, 
and during that journey, he sketched out the design of EDSAC. Back in Cambridge, he found he'd been appointed director of the Vassla, uh, and he had complete freedom to do what he wanted. And he was inspired by the visit to the US, he was inspired by the EDVAC report, and he said, I knew how to build a computer. And what was more, the people in the maths lab who had not been to the Moore School didn't know how to build a computer. So he said he was, had complete freedom to make all the decisions. It didn't last because he trained so many good people that in later years, whenever he had good ideas, the other people had sometimes even better ones. Um, but he said at the time, he said, I didn't have to ask anyone, may I build a computer? He was just allowed to do what he wanted. He didn't have to put in any proposal. He didn't have to arrange a budget. He was in charge. And he could just go ahead. He said the times were extremely abnormal. It will never happen today. So he set about the task. He named the computer EDSAC, which stands for Electronic Delay Storage Automatic Calculator, not computer. And he did this as a tribute to EDVAC. The fact the names are similar was a deliberate uh, act on his part to say, you know, thank you, EDVAC, for the ideas. So tell us then about uh, the EDSAC. How was it built? What were its main characteristics? You have to understand Morris's motives for this. Um, when I mentioned earlier that he was inspired by Hartree and he was appointed to a job to give a service to people in computation. And he had noticed the labor, the drudgery of doing calculations by hand, turning a hand, handle of a Brunswicker and so on. Uh, and he set about building machines because he wanted to help them. And he did more than help them, he transformed, of course, their lives. He pioneered, of course, hardware development, but he also pioneered software development too, because if you're trying to provide a machine for people to use, you've got to do the software as well as hardware. The machine had about 3,000 vacuum tubes uh, in 12 racks. It had this delay line memory made out of uh, tubes filled with mercury. There were 32 tubes. Each tube had 32 17-bit words, so 1,024 word memory for data and programs. It ran at about 650 or 700 instructions per second, and it had input from paper tape and output onto a teleprinter. Now, you may say, and many people have said since, how slow, how small, you know, how, what was the importance of EDSAC? It was such a slow machine compared with today. You've got to understand one very important thing. EDSAC replaced a human operator and a mechanical calculator. And this increased the power factor. The power factor increase from that technology to the electronic technology was, a, we reckon, was roughly 1,500 times. Now, that is arguably the largest jump forward in computer power, not only before or since, but also since. Um, so it was, it was that change from what was before to what became that completely transformed the life, of course, of scientific computation. When did EDSAC uh, become operational, David? Well, John, as you mentioned in your introduction, in fact, 62 years ago, Last week, 6th of May, 1949, as Morris says in his memoirs, rather suddenly on the 6th of May, 1949, the machine read in a paper tape for computing a table of squares and printed the results. And he also said, we said prayers for reliability, for reliable answers. And he got them. It was reliable. Another quotation which I rather like is that in 1949, as soon as we started programming, we found to our surprise that it wasn't as easy to get programs right as we had thought. <laughs> Debugging had to be discovered. I can remember the exact instant when I realized that a large part of my life from then on was going to be spent in finding mistakes in my own programs. Now, actually, being Morris and being the boss, in years later, he got other people to found his mistakes for him. <laughs> Now, you know, uh, by being involved in history, as long as you have, uh, we use the word first uh, somewhat advisedly, but I think it's in general agreement everywhere that ADSAC was the first 
electronic stored program computer to go into regular service. Uh, and I just wanted to ask you, how did that happen and what was it like when it happened? Yeah. I, I might say that title of that long-winded title, the first to go into regular service, I think was eventually agreed in, in a pact with Manchester. <laughs> Because Manchester had the first stored program computer a year before, there was no doubt about that. Right. But the Manchester machine did not go into regular service. Because it's, again, it was Morris's motives. He wanted to help researchers do their computation. So as soon as the machine was working, he opened it up. He sent a memo around to many people in the university saying, in my words, not his, uh, I've built an electronic calculating machine. Please come and use it. Now, in those days when people pioneered the use of computers, they're rather frightened of users, might damage the machine. But Boris said, no, no, come and use it. He did have one hurdle uh, to use the machine. Anyone who wanted to have an allocation of computer time had to go before what they called a priorities committee. Uh, and it was a, a panel of staff in the lab, chaired by Morris, where new applicants to use the computer would come and describe what they were trying to do and how they were going to do it. And the motive of letting them do that was then to advise them how best to do it. It wasn't to check, oh, you, you know, we can't, we can't let you do that, and so on. Any likely project was always approved, but they, they were helped by this inquisition, if you like. And the many, many programming te techniques in, in that time were pioneered by users, by students, by staff, and so on. Um, David Wheeler invented the subroutine, now, and enough said, <laughs> most fundamental uh, improvement on programming techniques. But they also developed debugging techniques and ways of tracing problems and so on. At the same time, they instituted a series of seminars. Every Thursday afternoon, they would have a seminar on some subject of computing, and they were attended by people from all around the country. Almost anyone who was into computing in those days, the early 50s, went to the Cambridge Thursday seminars. And then also, there was the annual summer school where people were invited to come, I think they probably had to pay a fee or something, to learn how to program. Uh, I can't remember which year it was. I wasn't there, of course, I was too young. But the great, uh, a young, bright young mathematician from the Netherlands attended that summer school. He was called Edsker Dijkstra. And you know where he went to. So I think the programming achievements of Edsack and Morris were just as great as the pioneering uh, electronic achievements. So it, it contributed to such great things. What, what became of this machine that we see on our screen? It, it transformed academic research in Cambridge. Of that, there was no doubt. It enabled advances in science, enabled problems to be tackled that had never, could never be thought of even, uh, let alone attempted. It contributed to two Nobel Prizes, John Kendrew, a uh, molecular structure of myoglobin, and Martin Ryle, both since uh, then knighted in radio astronomy, and even the big rival to um, uh, Martin Ryle, Fred Hoyle, the astronomer, he mentions Ed Sack in his, sci his science fiction novel, The Black Cloud. And if you read The Black Cloud, it describes the mass lab and the Ed Sack computer and the instruction code in, in great detail in the middle of a science fiction novel. Anyway, by 1958, the machine had been operational for nine years, um, the lab had started to build another, had built another computer, the EDSAC II, much less well known. Um, it was superior in every way to EDSAC. It was faster, it was bigger, more memory, it was nicer to use, and so naturally took over the workload. There's no point in using EDSAC with this better machine there. So on the 11th of July 1958, they scrapped it. It was taking up valuable space. That room there and that thing was quite a big room. And we needed the, they needed the space. So they threw it away. The odd chassis was kept, I think rather by accident than design. No thought of history. It was, it was no longer needed. It was, it was, it was yesterday. And so that's what happened to Adsac. It was thrown away. And as with so many great machines, that was that. Yeah. Well, not quite in a way, because you heard, those who were here at lunchtime, you heard about the Adsac replica project. Uh, we've been promised funds to build a replica of Adsac, uh, and Kevin talked about that today. So Adsac, I hope, will live. <clears throat>
So let's now move on to um, the post-EDSAC period and Sir Morris's uh, many achievements. So after EDSAC, uh, there was EDSAC II, and what were its uh, essential qualities? Well, EDSAC II was also another room full of vacuum tubes. They were more advanced, these vacuum tubes. They were small ones, not big ones. Um, but it contained many innovations over EDSAC, designed either by Morris Wilkes or by David Wheeler. For example, Morris invented, discovered microprogramming, and EDSAC II was a microprogrammed machine. Uh, it was a bit slice machine. That was an innovation. The picture you see there is of one of our engineers, that's a bit slice. That chassis he's pulled out of the, the rack is one bit of the arithmetic unit. And the rest of that is, uh, unit are the other chassis around there. And those are interchangeable plug uh, chassis. So if one chassis blew, you took it out, put another one in, bit sliced. It had two core memories. Its memory was magnetic cores. It's interesting, they still called it EDSAC II because quite late in the design, they thought they were going to use delay lines again so, because the, ed, the, the, the EDSAC delay storage. But they didn't. In fact, when I became a student there, we spent a long time looking for the delay lines. And no one had told us that there was no delay lines. They got magnetic cores. And he had two core memories, an normal one, read-write, 1,024 40-bit words. And he had a second one, a read-only memory, in which was permanently stored mathematical functions, a symbolic assembler, magnetic control routines, and so on, and debugging routines. It had a rich instruction set. It had both fixed-point arithmetic and, and floating-point arithmetic. It had a very comprehensive instruction set. Its speeds, uh, it took about 30 microseconds to do a floating-point add, um, 150, say, to do a, or a bit more, to do a multiply and a divide. It was a dream to program. It was so well designed. And it, that, again, was part of the mission. Morris wanted to enable people to use computing. And it expanded the user base enormously. And I gather this was about the time that you entered the picture through the mass lab. Yes. Uh, a bit traumatic, that. I went to Cambridge to read mathematics, as Morris had done before the war. Um, and I thought I was quite clever. To get into Cambridge and maths, you have to be clever. But I discovered something after two years, that Cambridge mathematics is extremely difficult, unless you are very, very clever. And I wasn't very, very clever. I struggled for two years, and I got myself a second class result in my examination. Um, but I was no way I was going to do a third year in maths. So it was just not, no point, it would be a waste of time. So I had to, even though I got qualified for my degree, you had to be there three years to get your degree. So I had to find something to do for my third year. So I went to my tutors in my college and I said, help, what do I do? And we cast around and discovered this postgraduate course in a quaint title. It's called the Diploma in Numerical Analysis and Automatic Computing. It was it's since then been called the Diploma in Computer Science because in those days we didn't call it computer science. And I did that course in my third year uh, and I enjoyed it. It was great. And when you enjoy something, you do well in it and I did well in it. And so they said, you can do a PhD. Uh, I said, what's that? Oh, you know, do three years' work, write a thesis, get called doctor. Um, it also got me out of the national service. I, had, I was able to dodge the draft by doing it. That helped, too. Um, and I spent my PhD, um, in the end, writing a compiler for that sec, too. So it, it might be that anyone would be coming aboard at that time doing research, but how was it that you wound up with Morris Wilkes as your research advisor? It was somewhat by default and, again, accidental, like most of my career. Um, when I said to, to Morris, yes, I will, I will do research, uh, he said, well, you've got to find a subject to do. And I said, well, I fancy doing something in programming. I mean, programming languages were sort of being thought about and sort of existed. And I said, that would be nice. And Morris said, you can't do that. It's been done. Tony Brooker in Manchester had written an autocode, so it's been done. And, uh, oh dear. And what happened in those days when people did research in computing is they tended to attach themselves to a particular application subject and do the programming for that subject, like theoretical chemistry or physics or mathematics or whatever. And they attached me to the high energy physics group. 
Now, how did you physicists, are the last of the really big physicists, you know, they're, they're very important. They were analyzing bubble chamber photographs, and I was sent off to lectures in physics, which I didn't understand a word. Uh, and I also discovered that the physicists themselves knew exactly how to program quite happily and didn't need me. Thank you. So I, I nearly dropped out of it. I, I got so depressed until I discovered a visitor in the lab, one Harry D. Husky, of whom I'm sure you all know. Harry was on sabbatical in Cambridge at that, that term, and he got his Nelliac language he was working on <coughs> there in Cambridge, and I, I met him and we talked about it and that, and it was that that caused Harry to persuade Morris that I could do programming after all. So I'm very grateful to Harry Husky. <laughs> and uh, there I was. <laughs> so after EdSec 2, then what? Was there an EdSec 3? Was, was well, the not really. Um, in the 1960s, when EdSec 2 had been in operation for a, a couple of years, Morris started to plan the next machine. Um, but by then, of course, there was a computer industry, and we thought, although it's fun to build machines, perhaps we ought to buy one um, and not just play around with hardware. But there was a problem. EdSec 2 was so good, and its power was such that there were very few sh machines on the market that were worth buying, because they weren't powerful, you know, the same power as EdSec. There's no point in replacing EdSec 2 with something the same size. Whereas the money he had from the government to buy his third machine was just right enough to buy one of those smaller machines. And there were only two machines that were worth looking at. One was the IBM 7090, um, and the other one was the Ferranti Atlas. You'll, you'll know about the 7090, you may know less about the Atlas. The problem was that both were horrendously expensive. We had nothing like the right amount of money. Um, Morris tried to persuade IBM to give us one, but even he couldn't charge, charm IBM that way. Uh, and so IBM fell out. And in the end, we teamed up with Ferranti. Um, Ferranti had built the Atlas in conjunction with Manchester University. And Ferranti decided that they wanted a smaller Atlas for their market. And uh, David Wheeler was engaged in the project to build a smaller Atlas, of which we would have the prototype. And that's how we afforded have a little thing. We called it Titan because all Ferranti machines in those days were called off to some mythical god, Perseus, Pegasus, Sirius, Atlas, and then Titan. Although, for those who know, um, Titan was eventually christened Atlas II because marketing people like to have a number in their names. Uh, and Titan was installed. We actually thought of calling Dead Sack III, that's what, uh, but we didn't. We thought it was not quite right. <laughs> since it had come from Ferranti and Manchester. Uh, so we had Titan. It was installed in 1963. EdSec 2 was closed down and scrapped, of course. Yeah, don't need the, need the space. In 1965. Now, users got very fond of old machines. They got to know to love them, their idiosyncrasies and so on. And they hated new machines because new machines were always late and the software never worked. And they said, we've got a new machine coming, it's going to be awful. So we never opened new machines, because there were a lot of razzmatazz of people saying these marvelous things arrived, and of course, it would actually be a load of junk for a few years. But what we did do, therefore, is we started to close old ones. Uh, and the picture you now have before you is of the crowd of the users in the machine room at the close-down ceremony. Um, the Morris, you can't see him in the picture, but that might be his head no, he's not. He's not bald. Um, bottom left. Uh, he read in the last program, which is on a piece of paper tape, black, of course, and he caused the machine to play the last post. He then hit the power off button, the machine room went silent, and grown men were seen to weep. Have you ever seen a machine decommissioned with such emotion and ceremony? Uh... Well, we did the same with Titan afterwards as well. Did you? I yes, see. yes, yes. Great. And we did the same with our first IBM mainframe in 1980 as well. It, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it became quite a tradition. Oh, it was. Oh, yes. yes oh, nice. So then we're into the 1960s. Uh, mm. Morris begins, uh, continues his work, rather, and discovers time sharing. Yeah, yeah. That was traumatic as well. Morris loved coming to the States, and he often was a visitor to MIT. And in about 65 or so, he visited MIT and saw the CTSS, the compatible time-sharing system that MIT had developed. And he came bouncing back to Cambridge, uh, and he said, we've got to have time-sharing on Titan. It, 
it's the way of the future. Now, of course, he was dead right, as he always was. But at the time, Roger Needham and myself and one or two others were struggling to develop this DART operating system on Titan. We were late with it. It wasn't time sharing, it was multi programming batch processing. And we weren't quite receptive to stopping that development and mid, stopping mid development and then adapting the system to time sharing. We had inadequate hardware, we got no disk or anything. But Morris insisted. He persuaded ICL to give him a disk. Um, we persuaded David Wheeler to modify the machine a bit uh, so that we could segment the store. And in fact, by, in two years, we had a time sharing system. We, we changed mid, mid course. And all because Morris said, you've got to have time sharing. Hmm. And he was absolutely right. And thereafter, feeding in paper tape or punch cards was a thing of the past. People sat at teletype terminals, and that's how they used computers thereafter. And, in, and at the same time, under Morris's leadership, one or two academics, including myself, our careers and its reputations were well established. So this was an ongoing theme at Cambridge in the 1960s, the use of electronic computing to really transform the whole field of academic research. Yeah. So how long, how long was this pursued? How long it, could it go on? No, it couldn't, because politically, by the end of the 1960s, uh, however good of a service we ran on these machines, and, it, and I, I, I'm a bit biased, of course, but they were good, um, it was politically untenable to conduct research into the development of computing services, or as the users put it, to continue experimenting on them. Uh, so there's a review, you know, what happens, the university sets a, a committee up and writes a report, and, and they said things have to change. And they changed in 1970, uh, when they divided the mass lab into two parts. They said, what well, part of this is computer science, it's academic, it's research and teaching, and the other part is a computing service. Uh, and although it stayed one department, of which Morris was the head, he was not responsible for the service, and they appointed a, a second director uh, to run the service, uh, would that director would report to a, a board in the university. Uh, and I became that direct, second director. And, so whereas all my career I'd been working with, for him, under him, or whatever, he became my colleague. Uh, and I worked alongside him. And that was very instructive. He was, a, he was very kind to me in uh, helping me become a man. I was only 20, 30, I was 32 years old or something. I mean, I, uh, I'd grown far too big, far too quickly. And, um, but, but it was, in fact, to me, a very important stage in my career. And I was very grateful to him for what we did. On, the, on his side, research continued. Uh, and they got into all sorts of new ideas. Uh, uh, earlier it was mentioned the cap machine, the capability machine. There's a picture of it, homemade machine, just to try out the concept of capabilities. And, uh, capabilities like segmentation. It's blocking out bits of memory and only let a, a process get at what it needs to get at and nothing else in a way of getting much more secure operating systems. And typical Cambridge, they worked out the ideas, they built the machine to do it, and they wrote an operating system and so on. Uh, research in Cambridge was very practical under Morris. But at the same time, Morris actually became quite a student of the history of computing, because in the 1970s became the centenary of Charles Babbage. Uh, and as Doran Swade has put it, um, he was the first modern scholar to study the manuscripts of Charles Babbage, which is true. And he gave a public lecture about Babbage in 1971, I think, which was a model. You know, he became a computer historian. So here he is, uh, as we now know, looking back on it, uh, a third of his life remaining, uh, a, a generation's worth of work ahead of him, but he is required under Cambridge policy to retire yep. at the age of 67. Uh, so tell us about that. He, yes, he was 67 years old by the end of the academic year, 1979-80. So he duly retired from his chair uh, and, um, uh, and left the lab. Uh, he finished off his memoir, uh, got it published. He was succeeded by Roger Needham. He packed up all the papers of, he had of the EDSAC and EDSAC II and deposited them in the archives. Uh, and Morris had a strong affection for the USA. He was always over here. Uh, and ever since he visited the Moore School lectures, 
and it seemed quite natural that he would emigrate. Um, so he went to digital at Maynard, um, and uh, he had a lovely time. Now, so here he is, this, this slide, uh, this is at that presentation that we just uh, saw Gordon Bell introducing. And that's a chassis, right, from, from EdSat? Yes, yes, we're not quite sure why he gave it away, but he did. <laughs> uh, we think you've got it somewhere. And we still have we, it, we, we absolutely do. We're it's proud. interesting, you won't show it to us. We're right? proud it's here. <laughs> we, we're very, very proud it's here. Yeah, yeah. Um, how long did he stay in America, and what did he do at Digital? I just find it fascinating yeah. that he, he comes over, he goes to deck. Of course, he meets Gordon. Yep. Uh, tell us a little bit about that period. He, he was here from 1980 to 86, um, and he joined the R&D group in digital as a senior consulting engineer. And apparently, as such, he did interact over the whole deck company. Uh, in 1982, uh, he relocated with the Digital's East Coast researchers to Hudson. Now, that was the site of their semiconductor design and fabrication, which well suited him because he was fascinated by electronics and electronic design. Uh, and he discovered that they were using technologies and uh, microprogramming technologies, for example, to build deck machines, which just completely took and used his insights of 30 years previously. Also, his final contribution uh, was he went to MIT uh, and continued to uh, was, was actually a hands-on manager in the Athena project. So there for six years. So uh, it's funny we were talking uh, before the program started tonight. One of our trustees, Ike Nassi, uh, was at DEC at that time and had an office just a few doors away mm. from Morris and was talking about how much he learned from him uh, at that yeah, point yeah. about the whole approach to computer design and problem solving. It's uh, even then, he was still teaching, wasn't he? he oh, was yes. Still, yes, uh, yes. Had a yes. lot, had a lot to contribute. Yeah, so, yeah. but then he stays here for six years. He goes back to the UK in 1986. Now, why did he do that? Morris had for many years been a fellow of St John's College, his college. There's a nice picture of it. Um, and to come to the States, uh, although he had retired from his university post, he still was a fellow of the college and something he much prized. And the rules of the college did not let fellows just disappear. Uh, indefinitely. You had to get leave to go, and he could only get leave in three-year uh, pieces. Uh, and he, so he got leave for three years, and then he got the leave renewed by the college. The college said, okay, you can stay again another three years. But after the second three-year period, I think he was told fairly bluntly by the college, if he didn't come back, he wouldn't have his fellowship renewed. And to him, his fellowship was important. Uh, it's a thing about Cambridge and so on. And I believe that's why he came back, because he wanted to keep his fellowship. Um, oh, there's, the, there's a nice quotation I got from Don Gorbatz, who was at DEC at the time, because uh, he had to attend his second retirement party. He had his first one, of course, in Cambridge. Uh, and Don says, to say that Morris and Nina Wilkes were released back to Cambridge with admiration and affection is an understatement on both counts. So did he really retire? This is his second retirement. Was this the... 1986, was this the retirement? No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> he came back and joined a research lab which was run by Olivetti. Olivetti, the Italian company, had taken over Acorn, which was the company that had developed the BBC Micro, and Andy Hopper, who was then a researcher in the, in the mass lab, in the computer lab then, uh, got the job of running this research lab on behalf of Olivetti. And Morris joined the lab and became a research advisor and had a job and so on and participated in all their activities. Uh, in 19, I don't know, when was it? Uh, oh, he was also a member of the Olivetti Research Board. So he was high up in that company. Uh, the Olivetti Research changed its name because it changed its ownership to AT&T in 1999. But it closed in the year 2002 because AT&T was trying to pass the lab on to Intel and it all fell through because the lawyers couldn't agree on the IPR. And so Andy Hopper said, right, we give up. And they formally made all the staff of the research lab redundant. So there's this kind of lovely British phrase uh, called being made redundant. I think we call it being laid off. Okay. Yeah. Right. So at the age of at the age of eighty nine, 
Morris Wilkes was laid off or made redundant. That's correct. From, uh, uh, all the staff, he was offered redundancy counselling. I don't think he took it. <laughs> <laughs> so finally, he came back to the computer lab in 2002. And until 2008, he regularly, every day, went to the lab, went to work. Uh, he studied current developments, he wrote papers, um, and he liked to meet the students. Every Friday in the lab, in the, in, well, I mean today, they have a happy hour for the students, where someone gets a barrel of beer and they relax and so on. And Morris would attend happy hour. You know, he, he liked talking to students. In fact, he never missed a party. Uh, if a, a member of staff was retiring, uh, he would be there. Even though they the person retiring was several decades younger than him. There was an annual lunch, there is an annual lunch for past presidents of the British Computer Society held in London, and he always went to that. He was there last year uh, and gave a short speech. Uh, he was quite crazy. The picture you've got before you was, it was actually not a, a retirement, but it was the memorial event for David Wheeler. Uh, and you can see that was in 2005, I think, yes. And, um, yeah, he was uh, pretty sprightly even then. He enjoyed parties. So let's talk a little bit about your personal recollections. You were with him for 52 years. He was your teacher. He was your mentor. He was your friend. Uh, tell us a little bit about David Hartley's view of Sir Morris. Yeah, well, he was my teacher, my research supervisor. Then he was my employer, my manager. And from 1970, as I said earlier, he was my colleague and so on. And then eventually he became my friend, although that took a long time. Um, particularly in the last years, I was a regular visitor to him. Uh, not because uh, he wanted me there, I think, but uh, no one else would go and see him. Because everyone else was either dead or not old enough. <laughs> and was saw, saw him, didn't really know him, and, and, and they saw him in awe. Well, I saw him in awe, but I, I felt it was my duty to go and see him. And I, I spent quite a lot of time with him. Um, he stopped going to the lab just a few months before Nina, his wife, died. Um, and he never went back after that, um, I, for, yet regularly. He went back for parties and things. But let me tell you some stories which I rather like about Morris. Um, in the 1950s, when I joined the lab, it was unusual to address colleagues by their first names. Britain were very formal. It was always Hartley, or perhaps Mr. Hartley, uh, possibly even David Hartley, but never David. Um, and, but in the induction we had when we joined the lab, we students, Eric Much, who was a sort of second in command, took us round. And he said, by the way, he said, we are very informal. We all call each other by our first names, except Mr. Wilkes is Mr. Wilkes. And... Uh, that was how it was for many years. He was just that bit higher than the rest and very rather formal, rather old-fashioned. But actually, he was very nice. Anyway, um, when I was completing my PhD, uh, I asked Morris, pardon, Mr. Wilkes, I said, have you got any jobs available? I like it here. We were working on the Titan computer in those days uh, when I finished my PhD, and I fancied the idea of having it staying on. And I said to Morris, any jobs? He said, well, sorry, no, we were full, unless somebody dies. Uh, but he found me a job. He, he was getting the Titan purchase. He was finding the money, raising money. Uh, and he was calculating how much he got and what he could get for it. And apparently, I didn't know about this at the time, he, he had just enough funds to buy the Titan with seven tape drives. He decided to do it with six straight drives and hire me. <laughs> and it's true. And he used to say later, I think on the whole we made the right choice. <laughs> Another story about him. Uh, he wasn't made a professor until 1965. Cambridge didn't give people chair, personal chairs then and, until they really could not have not do it. You know, it had to be right, it had to be totally, you know, no question. So he was given a personal chair in 1965. Uh, and as with personal chairs, of course, you, you choose your own title. And he chose the title of Professor of Computer Technology. 
And people said, that's funny, why? Everyone else who got personal chairs all around the world were called professors of computer science. Uh, and he, his reply always was this. I was once a scientist, and I know the difference. <laughs> we have uh, a couple more questions, and then I'll start taking your questions from the floor. So if you haven't already filled out your Q&A card, please go ahead and do that, and then we'll start, uh, we'll start that part of it. So you've told us a number of great stories like that over the last couple of days, and you know, you've, you've also mentioned that, uh, and you can almost see it in this picture, that he had this kind of penetrating look that he would fix upon you when he was really trying to make a point. So uh, what was he like? Was he brilliant? Was he demanding? Was he encouraging, unforgettable? What, what was it about him? He was brilliant to an extent, but not the most brilliant. What he was good at doing was spotting brilliance and bringing that brilliance on in other people. I mean, David Wheeler was brilliant. But David, David could never write papers, he could never express himself, and Morris encouraged him and made him do it. Um, he, but he had an endless set of ideas, uh, like microprogramming, um, uh, languages, debugging techniques, time sharing, databases he got into, networking, distributed computing, to mention only a few. And then with that came the David Wheeler, the Roger Needham, and others. Um, di was he difficult? He wasn't, you thought he was difficult, but he, he, what he was, he was firm in his views. And if he got an idea in his mind and he knew he was right, he was right, uh, and very often not wrong. He would he'd all, always listen, and he was prepared to adopt a different view. Was he demanding? He was a, what he was was a very skilled manager. He knew how to get people to do things and how to encourage them to do things. The most difficult person to manage ever was David Wheeler, without a doubt. David would not do things unless he really had to. Uh, and there's at least two examples of where Morris found a technique of getting David to do what he wanted to do. What he would do with Morris was when he wanted David to design a piece of equipment, like a multiplexer or something for a machine, Morris would sit down and design it himself. He knew the design wasn't very good, and he would show it to David, saying, I think we should do that. What do you think? And David would get very cross very quickly and say, this is how you do it. And Morris had won. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so 60 years on, it's uh, May 6, 2009, 60 years to the day since that first calculation. Yep. The Cambridge Computer Lab holds a seminar, a celebratory seminar, at which uh, Sir Morris is present. And there are uh, special presentations. Uh, Professor David Barron, uh, Doran Swade uh, pr made a presentation as well. And we have a, um, a short speech that Sir Morris made. Uh, this is 2009, not that long ago, the 6th of May. Uh, this was his last public presentation, and we thought it was fitting near the end of this uh, conversation before we get to your questions to show that. Ladies and gentlemen, what can I say but thank you for uh, this very happy day for me. I am proud of those early years. I'm delighted to find that uh, David Barron retains his knack of speaking very clearly, very understandably, very simply, and yet very deeply. Uh, and his, his lecture brings back to my mind many earlier lectures I've heard him give, a, give, a give, all in the same general style. And Don Swade I've not heard speak so often, but uh, he, he, I apologize if I said something discouraging about philosophy. I, <laughs> <laughs> I take it back and uh, uh, go. Say so I have been strengthened and supported by the philosophy I have heard. I think the uh, why, why uh, the EdSec project was so 
very successful. I think it was partly because, uh, although um, uh, digital computers were very new, uh, in fact, digital computing using desk machines had been going on in Cambridge and in other similar centers for quite a long time. I, as a research student, I myself did my turn of computing using a desk machine. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I knew the place, I knew that Cambridge was just full of young men uh, with more with, with sums they wanted to do, not necessarily vast things, not uh, not uh, numerical weather prediction and all that sort of thing, but rather simple sort of uh, uh, programming, calculation or integral or something, something that would take a week or two with a desk machine, it could be done very quickly with a computer. And uh, it, it was a definite feeling of everyone in the lab that as soon as we got used to having a computer, a running computer, and had learned to, uh, how to use it, and there we had, of course, the strength of David Wheeler, uh, the, uh, uh, all we had to do was to open the lab to anyone with interesting problems, useful problems, problems that were within the range of the machine, and let them come in and do their best. And of course, they flooded in. Uh, in order to accept, make it not absolutely too easy, we had a committee called the Priorities Committee. Perhaps a rather frightening name. It was intended to be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in fact, it was a wonderful club. I used to look forward with eagerness to the meetings because there were a lot of applicants coming along most anxious to be able to put their hands on this computer and uh, they were willing to take the time and trouble to explain to us what they were doing, uh, what their aims were and so on. And we learned a very great deal about the research that was going on uh, in Cambridge. Uh, anyway, it is, it is perfectly true that uh, the users were there for the computer. That didn't mean that there was not also scope for major problems. After all, there were two, uh, uh, two projects, uh, radio astronomy and uh, uh, protein structure. Uh, that, that major things in every way and subjects that earned their originators at Nobel Prizes. Uh, the headset was available to them as it was to others and uh, they contributed uh, to its success. Well, uh, they, they were wonderful years, of course. The EdSec had a will of its own, and uh, it, it all seemed, it seemed a very long time. Uh, it was in the process of building, and I think the EdSec must have felt that itself, because suddenly one day it gathered into itself its full strength and solved the problem. Uh, uh, that's, that's what it said, that is the event. We are celebrating exactly 60 years ago. Let me just say, let me just thank you for this. Thank you for this uh, most interesting afternoon. And uh, say, I, I, it is, of course, a sadness to me that those, those of us who used the EdSec in the early days cannot help but be saddened by the fact that uh, so many. Uh, our colleagues and helpers no longer alive, but that is as it's bound to be. There are some, fortunately, as uh, uh, as your survey the beginning showed, and I look forward to talking to them uh, in the course of the uh, of the afternoon. But let me thank you very much indeed for this uh, wonderful celebration. And, uh, thank you.
two reactions. Uh, one is, and we sort of exchanged a moment here. That was <coughs> definitely that look at the beginning of, uh, of his remarks as he was standing there looking at the... He, uh, he, he, he turned to the audience, he pulled himself up, and he looked everybody in the eye. Yeah. And that was as though to say, I'm here, I'm back. And the second thing was, I love the line about uh, all we really had to do was just open the, the lab, just open EdSec mm. and, and invite people to come in and work on it and solve their problems. What, mm. a, what a tremendously open oh, yes. attitude yes. to yeah. have had. But what had to go with that was a lot of other research, you see, in programming techniques to help them do their work. And that was, as I said earlier, I think their contributions on the programming side were just as important as they were on the hardware side. So one final thought before we get to the uh, audience questions. Here's the famous green door at the Mass Lab. So please tell us about that. The original building that housed the EdSag um, had been an anatomy laboratory. It was distinguished by the fact the only elevator it had in it was for horizontal people, not vertical ones. Um, and it was a nondescript building. And it had two entrances, one in the courtyard and one on the street side in Cambridge, just a, quite a small street, and there was this very grey, dirty wall, and in the middle was a door, the green door, which is mentioned, by the way, in Fred Hoyle's book about the Black Cloud. That lab was demolished in 1969 to make way for a new mass lab. Uh, and as they were demolishing it, the chief engineer noticed the door lying in a skip. So he took it out of the skip and hid it. Thought we'd better keep that. And put it in the basement of the new building where it rested for 11 years. But when Morris retired in 1980, we gave him a party and a presentation. But we had a second presentation. It was in a garden of a college that was happening. And, and at the right queue, two rather tough engineers came running around the, the bush, carrying the door on which we'd screwed a blast plaque, which you can see, and which we'd engraved Morris's name, and we presented it to him. We said, Morris, here you are, but on one condition, you can't take it away. And then thereafter, there's a tradition now in the mass lab, the computer lab, that when anyone retires who's been there long enough, their name is put on the door, the door is taken out of its glass case where it now lives, and they are shown the door. <laughs> and if I might add, I'm very proud that my name's on that door. <laughs> That's fantastic. So let's get to your questions now. Uh, many years ago, I had the great pleasure of chatting with Morris Wilkes about his study of the work of Babbage. His knowledge of Babbage's work was encyclopedic. Did he ever publish on the subject? I'm not sure. He did a lot of formal study. I mean, he went to the Science Museum and studied the works of Babbage, um, and he gave this lecture. I presume the lecture was published. Um, he, of course, also wrote a play, which was performed in the Boston Museum. Uh, he, wrote, he wrote a one-act play uh, called Pray, Mr. Babbage. Um, but I don't think he, he published anything particular. But I may be wrong. Hmm. Your museum will do. We should, uh, we should <laughs> get a copy of that script. Maybe we can perform the play. Yeah. I'm told it's not very good. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so this is a question I think people who are not steeped in history ask a lot, which is uh, the UNIVAC is often listed as the first computer, or perhaps uh, the ENIAC. What were the major differences between the UNIVAC and the computer at Cambridge? My understanding of the chronology was that, of course, we had the mechanical machines, the Harvard Mark I and so on, but the first, if we forget Bletchley Park, because no one knew about Bletchley Park anyway at that time, what they were doing, you forget Colossus, because no one knew about it. But here in the States, at the, in Pennsylvania, they developed the ENIAC. The ENIAC was electronic, enormously large thing, uh, and it was designed for really one particular job, that was calculating firing tables for artillery shells. Uh, and it was programmed by putting plugs in holes on the side of the machine. It 
there was, there was not a stored program, although many historians now claim that it had the ability to store a program. But it wasn't nominally known as a stored program machine. It was a machine for a particular purpose. But the ENIAC inspired a lot of people to start thinking about what happens next. And it was realized, I think, that the big problem, the big question was, how do you actually make a memory? Uh, so you could store the programs in it and the instructions in it. And people like John von Neumann, of course, with the EDVAT report, catalyzed those ideas about delay lines or whatever. So to my mind, the Moore School lectures were what was the coming together of all the people, a lot of the people involved. And, and they went away from that, more as having a good idea of what was needed. And so many then people started working on this. Uh, in, the, in Europe, in the UK, Manchester, who were anxious to solve the storage problem with Williams tubes, with cathode ray tube electrostatic storage. There was the NPL, National Physical Laboratory, and there was Cambridge. And although there wasn't really a race to do these different computers, in a sense, the Manchester machine was then the first one to, to bear fruit, and they did develop an electronic computer, as we know it, with a stored program. Uh, and I think we and Cambridge admit that they were the first stored program computer, and it was the storage of instructions in the memory that turned a calculation device into a general purpose machine. Because you could put any programs into a stored program machine and do any computation. And I think the breakthrough was the stored program machine. Manchester made that breakthrough, but their machine was really a proof of concept, a prototype. Uh, and what, when they got it working, they then said, right, now we'll build a real computer. Right. And then came the Mark I from Manchester, which came later. Whereas Morris at Cambridge was anxious to actually build one to use. I've said that several times tonight. Uh, and so he got there in 49. And then we have this pact with Manchester that we, we're the first stored program electronic computer that went into general service. It's... It's easy and simple to say what was the first computer. And, and what you end up doing is, first of all, def defining what computer means to suit the answer you want. Uh, the people at Blexley Park and Colossus claim that Colossus was the first computer. Uh, and, it, and it was a computer, but it was special purpose. It wasn't a stored program computer, really, but you could program it. But the program was done from outside, not inside. So it's the past, it's a good question, but there's no simple answer. Um, and I, I think it's best not to say what was the first computer. There were lots of first computers. There were lots of computer pioneers. There was no computer father, certainly not Turing. Uh, but then the Turing name in Cambridge is not the favorite person because we revere Morris. But the mathematicians revere Turing, quite rightly. Uh -huh. They all together contributed. They were all pioneers. And we got there. And eventually, after yeah, Edsac went to Leo, uh, the, Ferranti, the Manchester stuff went to Ferranti, uh, and that was whatever happened here, too, of course, in the States, and I'm not a scholar in that. So there were great pioneering days. There was no first. There was no first man. There were a lot of them. I think you've answered this next question in the context of that one, but let me just uh, ask it again. Uh, was the EDSAC designed completely independently of the work then going on at Bletchley Park? This is a two-part question. The mm. second one is, who paid for the hardware cost of the EDSAC? Okay. Um, as far as I know, when EDSAC was done, nobody outside Bletchley Park knew about Bletchley Park. It was a big secret. Now, obviously, some of the people who worked there knew about it. Um, Turing obviously knew about it. And when Turing, after the war, left and went to NPL, he would have taken that knowledge with him. Uh, but I'm pretty certain Morris knew nothing about it. Pretty sure. It was not only kept a secret during the time, but Churchill, our Prime Minister, was anxious that secret had to be kept because the code-breaking capabilities had to go on after the war. And he ordered the bombs and the colossi to be destroyed. We found out later they weren't all destroyed. They went into another secret place. Um, but the influence of Bletchley Park really came later. There are some who say it went out with Turing and uh, Max Newman and, it, and affected the Manchester people, but that's a very controversial thing. If you read the Annals of Computing, there's some recent papers there which are very controversial. 
And uh, I haven't heard a good analysis of what the truth is. Now, the payment for the EDSAC, I think as far as I know, Morris had a budget from the university to run the mass lab to provide these services. I think he must have done some begging and borrowing and stealing as well and, and persuaded people. Joe Lyons, the, the company that ran tea shops in London, gave him £5,000 and said, do what you like with it, as long as we can pinch your design when you're finished, which they did. That's fine. But somehow Morris got the money together, uh, or had the money. Uh, he got no big grants, not then. He got big grants later. It's actually a bit of a mystery where he got the money from, hmm. <laughs> to my mind. I think it was just in the bank. Yeah. Good. Here's a question. I think someone just wants to make sure uh, he heard you really correctly or she heard you really co correctly when you said that each one of those bit slicing chassis that we showed the picture of uh, handled just one bit. Yeah. Just one bit of data. Yeah, one bit in all the registers. Now, you see, the, the arithmetic unit had a series of registers to do adding and subtracting, multiplying, dividing. And then, in fact, there were, there were the address length words, which were the program counter and the index registers, and then there was a set of short chassis for those, and that was 11 bits long, and then the arithmetic unit was 40 bits long. And so each chassis had the storage of each bit, one bit in each central register, not of the memory, but of the registers, the accumulator, the other, other uh, things. And there were 40 of them side by side. So the, the logic of you know, adding and subtracting was, they were all one bit adders or one bit subtractors. And they all worked together to do multiplication. Here's a question I think really about the, the applications or maybe the users of the lab. But uh, were they working on solutions for military research or space research, things like that to your knowledge? Not, really, not, not in the very early days, I'm sure they weren't. They were doing scientific work within the university for their mm. research de de degrees. Um, I mean, we took in ex users from elsewhere, um, but uh, as far as I know, there was no secret research, certainly no military research. So here's the final question. This is a, this is a more uh, metaphysical, I think. What, what problems in either hardware or, or software remain to be solved for the general user, and, and how, in particular, do you think uh, Sir Morris would respond to that? Well, how I would respond, I will respond, and I, I bet I learned it from him. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is an unlimited set of problems that computers have not yet solved. That was no doubt. There's no limit. Uh, and as technology gets bigger and faster and cheaper and everything else, we we expand the universe uh, of the areas we can tackle. Um, so it, I'm sure there's no limit. I'm sure that there's no knowing what's going to come next. Computing, to my mind, has always surprised us by going off and do, doing what it's done. Every person who's tried to predict computing has probably got it wrong. Was it Turing who said that we would have artificial intelligence by the year 2000? He was totally wrong. And he was not the only person to be wrong. But to, to my mind, what's fascinating about a computing is you don't know what's going to happen. It surprises us. I mean, who would have known about FaceTube and, and YouTube and Facebook and all that? I mean, they're just totally, you know, no one thought of them. Right. Uh, and and that's, that, to my mind, is the excitement of computing. And I'm sure Morris would have shared that. Well, you've come a long way to give us uh, a fascinating look at a tremendous life. Uh, from someone who was so close to him for so long. So you've made us also, I think, feel like we're somehow part of this international celebration of his life and work that's taking place this year. So please know how grateful we are. You're a good friend of the museum, and we thank you so much for coming, David. Thank you. Okay.